Section 31 of A Visit to the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 16 of A Visit to the Holy Land, Egypt and Italy, Part 1, by Ida L. Pfeiffer. I visited many Christian churches, the finest among which was the Greek one. On my way thither I saw many streets where they can hardly have been room for a horseman to pass. The road to the Armenian church leads through such narrow lanes and gates that we were compelled to leave our asses behind. There was hardly room for two people to pass each other. On the other hand, I had nowhere seen a more spacious square than the Uzbeki place in Cairo. The square in Padua is perhaps the only one that can compare with it in point of size, but this place looks like a complete chaos. Miserable houses and ruined huts surround it, and here and there we sometimes come upon a part of an alley or an unfinished canal. The center is very uneven and is filled with building materials, such as stones, wood, bricks, and beams. The largest and handsomest house in this square is remarkable as having been inhabited by Napoleon during his residence at Cairo. It is now converted into a splendid hotel. Herr Chamion, the council, was kind enough to send me a card of invitation for the theater. The building looks like a private house and contains a galley capable of accommodating three or four hundred people. This gallery is devoted to the use of the ladies. The performance were all amateurs. They acted an Italian comedy in a very creditable manner. The orchestra comprised only four musicians. At the conclusion of the second act, the consul's son, a boy of twelve years, played some variations on the violin very prettily. The women, all natives of the Levant, were very elegantly dressed. They wore the European garb, white muslin dresses with hair beautifully braided and ornamented with flowers. Nearly all the women and girls were handsome, with complexions of a dazzling whiteness, which we rarely see equaled in Europe. The reason of this is, perhaps, that they always stay in their houses and avoid exposing themselves to the sun and wind. The following day I visited the abode of the howling dervishes, in whom I took a lively interest since I had seen their brethren at Constantinople. The hall, or rather mosque, in which they perform their devotions is splendid. I was not allowed here to stand among the men as I had done at Constantinople, but was conducted to a raised gallery, from which I could look down through a grated window. The style of devotion and excitement of these dervishes is like that I had witnessed at Constantinople, without being quite so wild in its character. Not one of them sank exhausted, and the screeching and howling were not so loud. Towards the end of their performance, many of the dervishes seized a small tambourine, on which they beat and produced a most diabolical music. In the slave market there was but a meager selection. All the wares had been bought, and a new cargo of these unfortunates was daily expected. I pretended that I wished to purchase a boy and a girl, in order to gain admittance into the private department. Here I saw a couple of negro girls of most uncommon beauty. I had not deemed it possible to find anything so perfect. Their skin was of a velvety black, and shone with a peculiar luster. Their teeth were beautifully formed and of dazzling whiteness, their eyes large and lustrous, their lips thinner than we usually find them among these people. They wore their hair neatly parted and arranged in pretty curls round the head. Poor creatures! Who knows into what hands they may fall! They bowed their heads in anguish without uttering a syllable. The sight of the slave market here inspired me with a feeling of deep melancholy. The poor creatures did not seem so careless and merry as those whom I had seen on the marketplace at Constantinople. In Cairo the slaves seemed badly kept. They lay in little tents and were driven out when a purchaser appeared, very much in the manner of cattle. They were only partially clothed in some old rags and looked exhausted and unhappy. During my short stay at Cairo, one of the chief feasts of the Mohammedans, namely Mashtalanshur, or Birthday of the Prophet, occurred. This feast is celebrated on a great open space outside the town. A number of large tents are erected, they are open in front, and beneath their shelter all kinds of things are carried on. In one tent, Mohammedans are praying. 
In another, a party of dervishes throw themselves with their faces to the ground and call upon Allah, while in a third, a juggler or storyteller may be driving his trade. In the midst of all stood a large tent, the entrance to which was concealed by curtains. Here the bayadirs were dancing. Any one can obtain admission by paying a trifling sum. Of course I went in to see these celebrated dancers. There were, however, only two pairs. Two boys were elegantly clothed in a female garb, richly decorated with gold coins. They looked very pretty and delicate, so that I really thought they were girls. The dance itself is very monotonous, slow, and wearisome. It consists only of some steps to and fro, accompanied by some rather indecorous movements of the upper body. These gestures are said to be very difficult, as the dancer must stand perfectly still and only move the upper part of his person. The music consisted of a tambourine, a flageolet, and a bagpipe. Much has been written concerning the indecency of these dances, but I am of the opinion that many of our ballets afford much greater cause of complaint. It may, however, be that other dances are performed of which the general public are not allowed to be spectators, but I only speak of what is done openly. I would also by far prefer a popular festival in the East to a fair in our highly civilized states. The Oriental feasts were to me a source of much enjoyment, for the people always behaved most decorously. They certainly shouted and pushed and elbowed each other like a European mob, but no drunken men were to be seen, and it was very seldom that a serious quarrel occurred. The commonest man, too, would never think of offering an insult to one of the opposite sex. I should feel no compunction in sending a young girl to this festival, though I should never think of letting her go to the fair held at Vienna on St. Bridget's Day. The people were assembled in vast numbers, and the crowd was very great, yet we could pass everywhere on our donkeys. At about three o'clock my servant sought out an elevated place for me, for the great spectacle was soon to come, and the crushing and bustle had already reached their highest point. At length the portly priest could be descried riding along on a splendid horse, before him marched eight or ten dervishes with flags flying, and behind him a number of men, among whom were also many dervishes. In the midst of the square the procession halted. A few soldiers pushed their way among the people, whom they forced to stand back and leave a road. Whenever the spectators did not obey quickly, a stick was brought into action, which soon established order in a most satisfactory manner. The procession now moved on once more, the standard-bearers and dervishes making all kinds of frantic gestures, as though they had just escaped from a madhouse. On reaching the place where the spectators formed a lane, the dervishes and several other men threw themselves down with their faces to the ground in a long row, with their heads side by side. And then, oh horror, the priest rode over the backs of these miserable men as upon a bridge. They then sprang up again as though nothing had happened, and rejoined the advancing train with their former antics and grimaces. One man stayed behind, writhing to and fro as if his back had been broken, but in a few moments' time he went away as unconcernedly as his comrades. Each of the actors in this scene considers himself extremely fortunate in having attained to such a distinction, and this feeling even extends to his relations and friends. Shabra one afternoon I paid a visit to the beautiful garden and country house of the Viceroy of Egypt. A broad, handsome street leads between alleys of sycamores, and the journey occupies about an hour and a half. Immediately upon my arrival I was conducted to an outbuilding, in the yard belonging to which a fine large elephant was to be shown. I had already seen several of these creatures, but never such a fine specimen as this. Its bulk was truly marvelous, its body clean and smooth, and of a dark brown color. The park is most lovely, and the rarest plants are here seen flourishing in the open air, in the fullness of bloom and beauty, besides those we are accustomed to see every day. On the whole, however, I was better pleased with the garden at Rhoda. The palace, too, is very fine. The ceilings of the rooms are lofty, and richly ornamented with gilding, paintings, and marble. The rooms appropriated to the Viceroy's consort are no less magnificent. The ascent to them is by a broad staircase on each side. On the ground floor is situate the favorite apartment of the Autocrat of Cairo, furnished in the style of the reception halls at Damascus. 
a fountain of excellent water diffuses a delicious coolness around. In the palace itself we find several large cages for parrots and other beautiful birds. What pleased me most of all was, however, the incomparable kiosk, lying in the garden at some distance from the palace. It is one hundred and thirty paces long and one hundred broad, surrounded by arcades of glorious pillars. This kiosk contains in its interior a large and beautiful fountain, and at the four corners of the buildings are terraces from which the water falls in the form of little cataracts, afterwards uniting with the fountain and shooting upwards in the shape of a mighty pillar. All things around us, the pavilion and the pillars, the walls and the fountain, are alike covered with beautiful marble of a white or light brown color. The pavilion is even arranged so that it can be lighted with gas. From this paradise of the living I rode to the abode of the dead, the celebrated world of graves which is to be seen in the desert. Here are to be found a number of ancient sepulchres, but most of them resemble ruins and to find out their boasted beauty is a thing left to the imagination of every traveler. I only admired the sepulchre of Mehemet Ali's two sons, in which the bones of his wife also rest. This is a beautiful building of stone. Five cupolas rise above the magnificent chambers where the sarcophagi are deposited. The petrified date wood lies about eight miles distant from Cairo. I rode out there, but did not find much to see excepting here and there some fragments of stems and a few petrifications lying about. It is said that the finest part of this petrified wood begins some miles away, but I did not penetrate so far. During my residence in Cairo the heat once reached 36 degrees reamer, and yet I found it much more endurable than I had expected. I was not annoyed at all by insects or vermin, but I was obliged to be careful not to leave any provisions in my room throughout the night. An immense swarm of minute ants would seize upon every kind of eatable, particularly bread. One evening I left a roll upon the table, and the next morning found it half eaten away, and covered with ants within and without. It is here an universal custom to place the feet of the tables in little dishes filled with water to keep off these insects. Excursion to Suez It had originally been my intention to stay at Cairo a week at the furthest, and afterwards to return to Alexandria. But the more I saw, the more my curiosity became excited, and I felt irresistibly impelled to proceed. I had now traveled in almost every way, but I had not yet tried an excursion on a camel. I therefore made inquiry as to the distance, danger, and expense of a journey to Suez on the Red Sea. The distance was a thirty-six hours' journey, the danger was said to be nil, and the expense they estimated at about 250 piastres. I therefore hired two strong camels, one for me, the other for my servant and the camel driver, and took nothing with me in the way of provisions but bread, dates, a piece of roast meat, and hard-boiled eggs. Skins of water were hung at each side of the camels, for we had to take a supply which would last us the journey and during our return. If we rode every day for twelve hours, this journey occupies six days, there and back. But as I was unable to depart until the afternoon of the twenty-sixth, and was obliged to be in Alexandria at latest by the thirtieth, in order not to miss the steamer, I had only four days and a half to accomplish it. Thus, this excursion was the most fatiguing I had ever undertaken. At four in the afternoon I rode through the town gate, where the camels were waiting for us, we mounted them and commenced our journey. The desert begins at the town gates, but for the first few miles we have a sight of some very fruitful country on the left, until at last we leave town and trees behind us, and with them all the verdure, and find ourselves surrounded on all sides by a sea of sand. For the first four or five hours I was not ill-pleased with this mode of traveling. I had plenty of room on my camel, and could sit farther back or forward as I chose, and had provisions and a bottle of water at my side. Besides this, the heat was not oppressive. I felt very comfortable and could look down from my high throne almost with a feeling of pride upon the passing caravans. Even the swaying motion of the camel, which causes in some travelers a feeling of sickness and nausea like that produced by a sea voyage, did not affect me. But after a few hours I began to feel the fatigues and discomforts of a journey of this kind. 
The swinging motion pained and fatigued me, as I had no support against which I could lean. The desire to sleep also rose within me, and it can be imagined how uncomfortable I felt. But I was resolved to go to Suez, and if all my hardships had been far worse, I would not have turned back. I summoned all my fortitude, and rode without halting for fifteen hours, from four in the afternoon until seven the next morning. During the night we passed several trains of camels, some in motion, some at rest, often consisting of more than a hundred. We were not exposed to the least annoyance, although we had attached ourselves to no caravan, but were pursuing our way alone. From Cairo to Suez posts are established at every five or six hours' journey and at each of these posts there stands a little house of two rooms for the convenience of travelers. These huts were built by an English innkeeper established at Cairo, but they can only be used by very rich people, as the prices charged are most exorbitant. Thus, for instance, a bed for one night costs a hundred piastres, a little chicken twenty, and a bottle of water two piastres. The generality of travelers encamp before the house, and I follow the same plan, lying down for an hour in the sand while the camels ate their scanty meal. My health and bodily stretch are, I am happy to say, so excellent that I am ready, after a very short rest, to encounter new fatigues. After this hour of repose, I once more mounted my camel to continue my journey. End of section 31